<coughs> Good afternoon friends, uh, this is Abhijit from IIT Madras and I am going to be your instructor for the next three sessions in uh, under the QEEE program and we are going to talk about spark gears. Okay? So without much of an ado, let us begin the contents of this talk. Yeah. So uh, here is what we are going to talk about. We are the, as the title of the talk suggests, we are going to talk about spark gears. Uh, so at the introduction, we will uh, talk about why do we need gears in the first place. We will have some motivation as to why gears form a very important machine element uh, for different applications and why is it that gears find uh, so very all pervasive uh, applications in uh, engineering as of today. We will then dissect out different parts of the gears, we will uh, introduce the terms and terminologies associated with the spur gears. The spur gear nomenclature would be elaborated hopefully by the end of the day today. Next day that is uh, in the next session we are going to talk about involute gearing in particular and hopefully we will have time left in the final session to talk about gear trains. So that being the agenda. Uh, Hopefully at the end of uh, these three sessions, you will come to know about the importance of gears in different transmission systems and in different machines. That is the first objective that I would like to set for ourselves. <coughs> we would also know the different types of gears that are used in applications that will be elaborated to the, through the talk right on today itself. But <coughs> the predominant portion of this material is going to concentrate about the geometry of the gear tooth. It is uh, not very obvious that there is a very special geometry involved in the gear tooth and that uh, speciality is very important from the kinematic perspective. So we are going to have a lot of elaborate discussion as to why that geometry is required in the first place and what is it about gear tooth geometries which uh, really uh, is important. So uh, even from the application perspective as well as from the manufacturing perspective. So we are going to have all the discussion and at the end of the course hopefully you should be aware that what is the gear tooth geometry that is typically used in application and what is the need for such uh, <coughs> geometry on the gear tooth. And uh, also we are going to do lots of analysis of input output characteristics of gears and gear trains. Different uh, problems are already posted in your assignments and multiple choice questions. You will be able to work those out hopefully with the theoretical background that you will gain from these lectures. Okay, so let us first understand the crucial part of a machine. Obviously a machine is re required to do some work. So therefore as per the first law of thermodynamics, law conservation of energy, power is required for any machine to operate. For any machine to operate, it, it is required by power, it is required to be powered. And this power is usually uh, provided through either an IC engine as in the case of automotive example or through some turbo uh, turbine, fluid power or uh, steam turbine, it could be gas turbine also and even it could be electrical motor. So in all these examples, what you will have is that what is typically called a prime mover. A prime mover is the source of power for that machine. The power is given to the machine to operate through this prime mover as is true for the uh, diesel engine or petrol engine, gas turbine, steam turbine, uh, hydraulic turbine, electric motor. These are all examples of a prime mover. But if you look at it carefully, the output of any of this prime mover or engine if you may like to call it is basically a rotating shaft and that rotating shaft conveys the torque as well as a rotating speed because it is a rotating shaft it has to rotate along with the rotation of the shaft a speed is conveyed. So anything which this rotating shaft which is let us say the crankshaft of your engine anything with which this crankshaft is getting connected will rotate at an identical speed. And also what is uh, probably a little difficult to fathom uh, other than the rotating speed is the fact that along with the rotating speed what is conveyed is a torque. It's a, uh, it is a, uh, this torque or the driving torque as we would call it is the one which will work against the load torque and create the necessary motion for uh, our 
for example in the case of automobile it is this driving torque which acts against the load torque and thus produces motion so this is elementary that you definitely have a prime mover or an engine which produces the power it but the power is itself if you recall engineering mechanics power is given as a product of torque and rotating speed so basically the output of any engine will have two important constituents one is the torque the second is the rotating speed the rotating speed is obvious you can visualize that because the shaft is rotating there is a speed associated with it but there is also a torque which comes from the engine to the gearbox or to the load whatever it is so there is this torque and rotating speed which are supplied by the engine to the output side and this product of torque and speed is essentially what is power as we learnt in our elementary engineering mechanics course. So that is the first part with uh, of the machine which is the prime mover or the engine in general. But now if we think carefully about the different kinds of machine that we have in applications, let us take one example here we get to see a crane, a mobile crane is schematically illustrated in this. Uh, figure what you see is that the purpose of this mobile crane is obviously to lift load right but the owner of this mobile crane would definitely like to have an objective that he wants to lift as high load as possible and he also wants to lift uh, this load as quickly as possible because obviously he has paid for the mobile crane and he wants this mobile crane to do maximum possible work. So this maximum possible work can arise in two different contexts. The demand from the customer could be that one has to lift maximum possible load. This in turn means maximum amount of torque should be supplied from the engine such that maximum load is being able to be lift, lifted through this uh, hoisting mechanism. So the torque must be able to uh, uh, do the work against the load. If you increase the load, the torque requirement is uh, going to enhance. Also you require that this load be lifted at the fastest possible speed so that the work gets done quickly and uh, uh, whatever it is work is associated with this mobile crane can quickly undergo completion in which case the mobile crane can be profitably deputed in some other application. So again dictated by the economics of the application you require that this load be hoisted as quickly as possible which means that the speed of hoisting should also be very quick. Again that dictates that whatever is driving this mechanism it definitely is an engine or in general a prime mover the rotating speed associated with those pulleys should be as high as possible. So definitely you want the machine to work which means you want power, the power is fed by the engine. You also want to lift the highest possible load which means you want the high torque coming out from the engine. You also want the load to be lifted at fastest possible speeds which means that the output speed coming out of the engine should be as fast as, as high as possible and you all want it at a minimal cost that means all of this should be attained with the minimum fuel efficiency with the minimum fuel cost associated with the burning of the fuel within the engine. So the requirements are really steep if you look at it from the perspective of the owner of this machine. You want any uh, sorry you want all the different factors which uh, the machine is, uh, uh, is designed for all of them we want it together. Okay, I will take one more example probably to uh, illustrate this aspect. This is a machine which is our usual lathe machine you would have seen that in workshop. Obviously the purpose of a lathe machine is to remove material. So you wish to remove during a turning operation for example you wish to remove material and you wish to have a maximum material removal rate so that you quickly finish the job and deport the machine to another productive job. So to have a maximum metal removal rate you could do it in two ways you could rotate the spindle holding the job as fast as possible or you could have a high depth of cut. Now you can understand if the depth of cut associated with the tool is high then the load then just try doing this experiment yourself that if you increase the depth of cut 
then beyond a point obviously you will, the spindle will not be able to rotate because the requirement of the driving torque to overcome the load will not be satisfied because the load will increase and the driving torque given by the motor which runs this rotating spindle is limited the maximum driving torque is limited so at some point it will you will not be able to take a depth of cut greater than what can be delivered by the motor so depth of cut obviously increases the material removal rate but you cannot achieve the depth of cut beyond a certain point beyond a certain point the load torque will increase and the driving torque will not be able to supersede the load torque as a result you will be limited to have a depth of cut within some reasonable uh, value similarly the other requirement is you want the speed to be as high as possible because the speed of the job will <coughs> ensure a greater material removal rate so both of these basically boil down to the requirements of the motor itself the motor must be able to have an output output of high torque as well as high speed right and you also want the motor to consume the least amount of electrical power right so all of these things are what is demanded by the customer i'll take one more example now which is from our, our automotive engines okay so automobiles as you know are uh, one very important case where gears are being used so let's take a look as to why we need gears in automobiles so first again let us do this analysis this simple analysis that what is the requirement of an automobile obviously to drive the vehicle you need power the power comes from the engine but the question is it is not just power it is also this torque and speed which is required from the engine right for example as you see in this picture this vehicle is negotiating a steep upslope and as the vehicle negotiates a steep upslope it a very high resistive load is encountered because it has to work against a component of its own weight right so just like while cycling uphill you get to you you, you almost feel that someone is trying to resist you back it, you are not being able to climb the uphill so very easily the same thing is felt by the vehicle which is negotiating a, a steep uphill terrain that is there is a very high resistive load so the engine associated with this automobile should be able to give that a uh, load torque which counters this resistive load otherwise the the uh, vehicle will not move up uphill but in some other cases there may be a downhill terrain or there may be a flat terrain in which case the load requirement is not so high when the <coughs> in comparison to this situation as you see in this picture if you look if you contemplate the situation when this very same vehicle with the very same driver is driving on a plain ter terrain the requirement of the driving torque is not so very high because the load torque is much lesser as compared to the uphill terrain so the moral of the story is while driving a vehicle the requirements of torque that has to be supplied has is going to be different depending upon the terrains which you uh, which the vehicle is uh, uh, undergoing also for a commercial vehicle when the commercial vehicle is operating in the full load condition the load associated with moving that vehicle will become high as opposed to the case when the commercial vehicle is running empty right so therefore the moral of the story as i said is that the vehicle to be drivable at diverse road condition it has to counter a wide range of load torque right this is something that the vehicle manufacturers are aware of and they have to design their vehicles such that depending upon the diversity of terrain for which this vehicle has to be used the there must be some suitable arrangement by which this diverse torque can be provided by a certain mechanism within the engine and this happens to be the gear the other counter example from the speed perspective if we talk again depending upon different drivers here we have a small cartoon showing two different drivers one very young and adventurous drivers he likes to ride his vehicle at a very high speed whereas another driver who is very calm and uh, probably takes life little easy in <coughs> such a case this person is driving very slowly so again depending upon the driving habits as also the road conditions you may have different requirements of speed from your automobile engine so there are different requirements of speed there are different requirements of torque owing to different driving conditions 
on the road and the automobile manufacturer has to make sure that all these different requirements are not only met, but they are met with a minimal cost. So, it is not just, uh, uh, it is not just uh, obvious that, you know, the vehicle manufacturer can need to provide an engine which supplies all this torque and all this speed, but it must provide a mechanism such that all this diverse torque and diverse speed can be supplied from the engine transmission system at minimal cost. That is very important. And the trouble lies here. Once you talk about cost, <coughs> there is a small little trouble. This is what we call the fuel consumption chart of a typical engine, right? So, what you see here on the x axis is the speed and what you see on the y axis is the brake mean effective pressure, which basically is a function of the torque. In some way, it relates to the torque. And these contour lines that you see on this figure are basically the values associated with the specific fuel consumption. So, what it shows is that this fuel consumption is least at a very small range of speed and a small range of torque. So, the fuel consumption will vary if the torque and the speed varies in an engine. So, you want the customer rather wants a varied torque. The customer wants a varied speed, but also the customer wants a varied torque and a varied speed at minimal possible cost, right? And the minimal possible cost of running the engine happens to be in this zone, wherein the torque and the speed is a very, very narrow range. You cannot supply that much diverse torque and diverse speed within that narrow band of operation. So, if the engine has to be economically operating, it is imperative that some other device is envisaged such that the engine keeps running at this amount of torque and this amount of speed, but something else which is precisely the gear will supply the diverse amount of torque and the diverse amount of speed associated with the different operating condition. This is exactly what is done by a gear. So, please understand the engine in itself is a powerhouse. The engine does provide power, the engine does provide torque, the engine does provide speed. But the problem lies is in this fact that whatever power, torque and speed the engine provides is in a, uh, the optimal running conditions of the engine is such that the torque and the speed bandwidth is pretty low. It cannot satisfy the diverse requirements of the driving conditions on road. So, to ensure that the driving conditions in road are meant, the driver's driving conditions on road are meant, we need to contrive a certain application which can scale up this bandwidth of available torque and available speed and thereby offer the user the diversity that he or she wants as he or she drives the vehicle. So, this is exactly what we will see is done by the gearing arrangement. So, just to complete this slide, as I said, for economic viability, the engine should run within a very narrow range of torque and speed, which is precisely this range, right? You see that the fuel consumption increases drastically as you surpass this narrow speed. From 275, it goes to 290 and then it crosses 300 pretty quickly. So, if you in fact want to run the same engine without any gearing arrangement, without any transmission arrangement, what will happen is that the fuel consumption will drastically increase and the economics of the uh, entire operation will break down. So, the user demands of the wide range of torque and speed cannot be economically met by the engine alone. Therefore, you need some supporting uh, structure, which is basically the transmission which is what we are coming at. So, this course is going to be about the gears, it is not going to be about the engines, but I thought it is important to understand the link between the engine and the gear, so that you are able to better appreciate the uh, uh, usefulness of the gear application. So, here is a simple schematic of a gearing arrangement. So, what we do is the following, as I said, the engine output shaft provides a certain torque and a certain speed, I call torque as T and speed as omega, right? So, what we do is we attach this engine output shaft with a gear of radius d and mesh this gear or rather 
uh, I mean, if I am, if I don't use this technical word mesh, I, uh, what I uh, do is that I engage this gear along with a larger gear, the diameter, the size of which is n times d. The size of the gear which is mounted on the engine output shaft is d. The size of the gear which is in contact with or in engagement with with this gear is n times d, right? <coughs> what turns out is that the output shaft which is mounted on this gear, right, is the which is rather which is connected to this gear will deliver an output torque which happens to be n times t and it will have an output speed which happens to be omega by n. So, the output from this arrangement will now be n times t and omega divided by n. So, in other words, if n is positive as is shown in this figure and as is the case that you will see that the torque supplied by the engine can actually be scaled up, right, if n is a number greater than 1 as is seen in this picture. So, the torque whatever the engine is delivering can be scaled up by a gearing arrangement, but since a gearing arrangement has to follow conservation of energy associated with an increase in torque, there has to be a equivalent reduction in speed. You cannot ask for both torque and speed together to be increased because if torque and speed together increases that is virtually saying that energy, new energy has been produced. That cannot happen. Energy can be produced only at the engine level which happens also because of burning of the fuel. Whereas in the gearbox there is no fuel that is getting burned, so energy cannot be produced, right. So whatever is the energy supplied that has to be the same as the energy output that is assuming that the there are no losses in the transmission. In fact, practically compared to the engine, transmission is a very efficient device, the losses are quite minimal as compared to the engine. So getting back to the point, the point is the T times omega is power which is supplied by the engine. And the power which is available at the output shaft, this black shaft is n times t into omega by n, which means it is actually the same power which is available, but the trade off between torque and speed can now be attained simply by sizing this gear. By playing with this number n, I am able to have whatever torque I want. I will be sacrificing the speed, that is correct, but whatever torque I want, I can attain simply by going with different values of n and this is exactly what happens in a car gear. If you, uh, if you have observed the driving of a car and some of you have, you may have yourself driven a car, you will understand that in first gear uh, or rather when you have to go that uphill terrain, you are basically in the first gear. In the first gear, this n value is pretty large which means that the driving torque which comes out from the transmission and goes into the wheel axle is actually large. It is large enough so that it can supersede the load torque requirement and as a result when you are uh, going for in an uh, uphill terrain, you are uh, going to go in a, uh, in the first gear. What happens in the higher gears, let us say third gear, fourth gear, fifth gear, this n value keeps on decreasing and as n value keeps on decreasing, the torque requirements or the torque delivery is decreased because the vehicle is already running fast the load torque associated or the resistive load as the vehicle faces is not so high and as such you can come down to the driving torque requirements and increase the speed if you want. So it is always this trade off between torque and speed which keeps happening every time the driver changes his gear and also you have automatic gearing system even in those automatic gearing system this is the trade off which happens within an electronic controller for example and in those uh, cases also it is just the torque and the speed balance which is being played with, right. So anyway we are going to stick with manual transmission and spur gears more particularly, but you must understand that at least from the automotive context the reason why we have gears is to enable the vehicle to supply different torques and different speeds as per the requirements uh, of the uh, driving conditions. So keeping the engine torque and engine speed in the optimal range, a wide range of output torque and output speeds can be obtained using the gear. So simply by changing this value n, 
So, associated with a 5 gear uh, transmission system, you will have different 5 different values of N, each will engage at the time the uh, driver engages the lever associated with the gear and each time this value of N will change and as a result you will get different torque coming out from your <coughs> power uh, house of the engine transmission taken together. Okay. As I said power produced by the engine is equal to the power consumed by the load. So, definitely there is nothing, uh, no power which is getting manufactured or which is getting destroyed also at the transmission. So, as I said the transmission losses are supposed to be minimal, but yes there are transmission losses. If you ignore the transmission losses then you can make this simplistic uh, argument that the power produced in the engine will be equal to the power consumed at the load uh, level, which is basically the output of the gear. Okay. Uh, so, owing to this reason, uh, gears occur in a wide range of application, they are ubiquitous. Uh, automobile being one of them, even in your lathe machine you have gears, there are uh, many different applications where uh, you know gears have to be there simply because of this reason that machines are not designed for one condition. They are designed to be operating on diverse condition. The power requirement of the machine is met by the engine, but the torque speed balance requirement cannot be met by the engine at least from an economical standpoint. So, from an economical standpoint it is imperative that the engine be clubbed along with certain gearing systems such that the diversity of the torques and the speeds that can be tapped in through that engine system increases manifold. So, gears are so very uh, all pervasive that even your make in India logo you can find it is all this lion is made up of just gears. So, gears do occupy a very central uh, and pivotal position in engineering. Uh, I have seen most of the engineering college mechanical in, uh, festivals, mechanical engineering festivals including the one at IIT Madras use a logo which have something, uh, some pictorial form of gear depicted in it. So, that is the reason why gears are very, very important and rightly so it has found its place in most uh, uh, of the logos associated with engineering. Okay, so, with that little introduction let us now get into the heart of the topic. We will first study an elementary concept that of a friction disc and from the friction disc we will move on to uh, uh, what is technically called as gears. So, here we are seeing two discs basically one in blue and the other in red. The sizes of the two discs are shown as R1 and R2. What we mean by friction disc is the following that when these two discs are rotating the point of contact is at a no slip condition. What is meant by no slip? It means that the point of contact whether you assume this point of contact to be a point embedded in this blue body or a point embedded in the in the red body either way the velocity is going to be the same right. So, that is basically the no slip condition whenever you have two bodies in no slip that means the point of contact between the two bodies will have identical motion whether you assume the point of contact to be embedded in one body or the other. So, that is technically what is called a no slip condition. So, if you have enough friction between the two bodies then this condition of slipping will not arise and you will have the no slip condition. So, when we say that the, the, these two bodies are friction discs we essentially mean these are two discs wherein there is enough friction between them such that the no slip condition is always satisfied. And if there is a no slip condition that always satisfied what we will have is that the point of contact will have the same velocity whether you consider the point of contact to be associated with body uh, 1 that is the blue body or body 2 which is the red body. So, this is what is called the uh, no slip condition and essentially if you assume the point of contact to be embedded in body 1 then the velocity of the point of contact is omega 1 r 1. The linear velocity is angular velocity times radius. Similarly, if I assume this point of contact to be embedded in body 2, then the linear velocity of this point of contact would be omega 2 times r 2. And as I am saying that by our very assumption that it is a friction disk situation which essentially means that there is ample friction 
so as to ensure the no slip condition and the no slip condition in term means that the velocities will be same this essentially boils down to the requirement that omega 1 r 1 is equals to omega 2 r 2 so this is exactly what we will get even for gears so therefore it was worth discussing this fact but now you can understand that how the gearing arrangement will work the idea of you know increasing the speed or decreasing the speed can be very easily attained through this for example uh, if the input shaft input rotating shaft which is connected to the engine is this blue uh, this blue uh, disc the input shaft on the input shaft we have mounted this blue larger disc right and on the output shaft we have mounted this red smaller disc then what will happen because of this omega 1 r 1 is equals to omega 2 r 2 requirement is that you will get to see that omega 2 is larger than omega 1. So the speed can be increased if the input is connected to this shaft which is holding the blue disc and the output is taken from the shaft which is holding the red disc. So you can get any speeds if you want and again by a law conservation of energy by whatever factor you gain speed you will drop the torque because you cannot gain both <coughs> speed and torque together if you have gained speed by a factor of 2 then you would have to lose torque by a factor of 2 again so that is a rule which you cannot play with the to total speed uh, the torque the product of the speed and torque has to remain constant because the total energy or power has to remain constant equivalently you can get a get get a higher torque by connecting the input to the red disc the smaller disc and taking the output from the shaft as, uh, attached to the blue disc right this is exactly what was happening in the previous picture we were taking the output from the larger uh, from the shaft uh, attached with the larger gear so in that case the torque the speed will decrease but associated with the speed decrease we know that the torque has to increase because that is what is dictated by conservation of uh, energy okay the so the question is if we have been able to attend this by simple friction disc that is two discs with adequate friction then why is it that we need to go for a gearing arrangement that question is well taken so let us understand how this arrangement basically works because it is a friction disc the friction force develops only if there is a normal force between these two bodies so the normal force at the point of contact has to be in right only if there is a normal force there is a question of uh, friction because friction is mu times normal force so the mu times normal force is the tangential force or the frictional force which acts tangentially to these two discs and because of this tangential force you have a torque which is mu times n times r1 on one disc and mu times n times r2 on disc 2 right so therefore if you have to transfer a large torque you therefore need a large n right you get to see that both the expressions for torque have embedded in it the value of n which means that you need a large normal force which will permit only a large normal force will permit the transmission of a large torque now that large normal force will eventually get transferred to the shaft which holds the gear and that large normal force on that acting on that shaft will cause shaft deflection and once the shaft which is carrying this disc deflects that means the engagement will be lost so therefore you cannot assume that the engagement between these two discs will be very very reliable because of this large normal force there will be shaft deflection and once the shaft deflects the gears mounted on these two shafts will no longer be in contact and as such this is a deterrent for using friction disc friction disc can only be used if there is a requirement of very less torque being uh, transmitted only then friction disc can be used the other important problem associated with friction disc is that the value of this factor mu is not uh, very reliable again it keeps changing depending upon conditions depending upon lubrication conditions so therefore it is not going to be a reliable design if you go by this friction disc and therefore we come to gears rather than friction discs so large torque transmission is not possible in friction disc that is the major reason why we have to think beyond a friction disc arrangement and the arrangement that we will talk about now 
is going to be the gear arrangement. Okay, so just a brief introduction to gears before we take a short break. That is, gears are toothed wheels. So instead of friction discs of this kind, what we will have in gears is, the, is that, and I'll show pictures for uh, for you. These gears will be wheels like these, but they will have some tooth, right? So gears will be toothed wheel, and the objective of a gearing system will be to transmit constant angular velocity ratio between the two rotating shafts at all times, right? This is very important. If the input speed, or rather, uh, the, if the input speed to the transmission, which is effectively the output speed of the engine, if the output crank speed of the engine is constant, the output of the transmission should also be constant. You should not have a gear system where the output of the gear system is basically a fluctuating speed output even if the engine speed is constant because a fluctuating uh, a fluctuating output speed from the engine uh, from the transmission side can be a very very uh, can have very very detrimental effect because that will really hamper the ride quality for example in uh, automobiles it will lead to large vibration and eventual failure so it is very important that the gearing system does not introduce any additional fluctuations in the output speed. If the output speed coming from the engine is constant, gear should only be able to reduce it or increase it at a cons by a constant factor without causing any fluctuations to this speed. So that is an objective and we will see that this stringent, ob because of this very stringent objective, you will have a requirement in terms of the profile of the tooth. The tooth, tooth profile cannot be arbitrary. For example, you will actually, though it may appear to you that these tooths are, uh, are straight, in fact, it is not so. The tooth profile is special geometry and the requirement of this geometrical profile of the tooth stems from the fact that it is only a very specialized geometry which will actually ensure that the angular velocity ratio is constant between the two sides of the gear, the input side and the output side that is, okay. So that is a very crucial objective in our gearing system. Uh, as we will talk in greater details, but hopefully by now you have learned some uh, elementary concepts in mechanism. Gears happens to be higher pair mechanism. In contrast to your slider crank mechanism or four bar mechanism, which are lower pair mechanisms made of revolute joints or prismatic joints, gears are higher pair mechanisms. You will understand that a revolute joint or a prismatic joint has a surface of contact. When you have the piston moving within the cylinder walls, it is having a surface of contact between the cylinder walls and the outer cylindrical surface of the piston wall. So therefore, a, a slider crank mechanism is a lower pair mechanism, whereas a gear, the contact between two gears is, at least in a spur gear case, it is a line contact in three dimension. And if you take only the front view of it, as we will do in most of our illustration, we can say that it is a point contact. So none the same gears are higher pair of mechanism. Uh, even uh, a helical gear will be a higher pair of mechanism. All gearing arrangement for that matter are higher pair of mechanism. Spar gears in particular will have line contact in reality. When you depict spar gears in, by a two dimensional drawing, you will have, uh, you depict only the front view of it, then you will get to see only a point contact, right? So point contact or line contact, either way, it is a higher pair mechanism. So that way, this mechanism differs from a lower pair mechanism which you have studied which could be of uh, mostly slider crank and the 4R mechanisms. Okay, uh, the other important thing is that very rarely you use one or two gears but we use a train of gears. Uh, again, to get back to the transmission system of an automobile, there is not one or two gears but quite a few gears. When you say there are five, uh, it, it's a five speed transmission, there are basically different gears that are there. So. A collection of such gears will be called as gear trains. So as opposed to just one or two gears uh, getting engaged, there will be a collection of gears and as we will see, our transmission box is essentially a gear train. So we will study the transmission box as a gear train as we go along. Okay, so 
<coughs> talking about different gear types, there are uh, many different gear types. The one that we will study that is associated with the transmission of motion between parallel shafts. You could have shafts in parallel, you could have shafts making an angle, you could have shafts which are skew, that means they are neither parallel nor intersecting accordingly. If you wish to transmit motion between any two of these different kinds of shafts, then you will have a different gearing arrangement. The ones that we are talking about, like in this case, in the case that uh, we just talked about, here you see that these two shafts, the input shaft and the output shaft are parallel. So therefore, we are talking about transmission between two parallel shafts and the gears associated with the transmission of motion between two parallel shafts will be either spar gear or helical gear. Both of them will be fine for the transmission between two parallel shafts. So getting back to the point that transmission between Parallel shafts can be attained either through a straight tooth gear which is called a spar gear which is what we will study in greater detail. The smaller gear between the two gears gearing when we say that there is a gearing arrangement there has to be two gears. The smaller gear is called the pinion and the larger gear will be called the wheel. Okay? <coughs> but uh, uh, spar gears are not the only sort of gears which are possible for between two parallel shafts, you can also have a helical gear and I will just talk about helical gear in a moment. But before that, uh, there is another very interesting case where we, if we take, if we contemplate this situation that one of these disc radius, one of the gear radius is actually going very large. As you know that if you have a circle of very large radius, it basically becomes a straight line, right. So in the limiting case that the wheel radius is becoming infinity you have a special case of a rack and pinion arrangement. So in a rack and pinion arrangement what happens is that you have a, a linear motion being converted to an angular motion. I can probably show you a picture to make myself clear. So this is a spar gear as you can probably see that there are holes in this gear and through these holes and there is a keyway here also if you could visualize this. So through these keyways and the hole there is a shaft which will actually get attached with the gear. and once the shaft is, shafts are attached to the two gears, basically the, you know, the gearing arrangement is such that motion from one shaft will get transmitted to the motion from the other shaft. But then since you see the alignment of the two holes are parallel, so basically the spar gear can only transmit motion in between two parallel shafts, it cannot do anything better. But now if you contemplate that this radius of this gear is keeping on increasing but holding the radius of the smaller gear fixed, then you will have a situation of this kind where this larger gear is now called a rack, right. So what happens when uh, uh, the wheel rotates? When the wheel rotates, it will be pushing the rack in one direction or the other. So the motion of the rack will be a linear motion whereas the motion of the pinion will be that of an angular motion. So depending uh, which side is a driver and which side is the driven, you, you will have the motion transmission as that of an angular to linear motion transmission situation. The other type of gear as I was mentioning is that of a helical gear. Please note the tooths of the spur gear are in alignment with the uh, axis of the gear itself, right. The shaft axis and the the, the tooth direction is along the same direction, right. Whereas in helical gear you will see that the tooths are not exactly in alignment with the um, axis of the gear or the axis of the shaft. So there is a helix angle at which this tooth is cut. So that leads to a, a sort of a quieter operations in gears, the dynamic loading is much better in case of uh, helical gears as opposed to spur gears. Usually helical gears are more costly to make but it is worth the cost in applications where customers are ready to pay that cost especially some uh, in, in high end cars where you know noise and vibration is an irritant. There it is most of these gears will be helical gears. But in certain other applications for example in lead machine possibly uh, in the workshop conditions we are not very worried about these additional vibrations in which case we can tolerate the cheaper spar gear. But the point is the only distinction between spar gear and helical gear is along is in the manner in which this tooth is cut. The geometry of the tooth uh, if you take it along any section is going to be identical. If you just take a slice of this tooth as a section 
then it it is uh, it is reasonably similar i should say but the po point of distinction being that these tooths are cut along the direction oriented along the axis of the gear or the shaft itself whereas these tooth on the helical gear are being cut at an angle or a helix angle as we call it we are not going to study helical gears in any further details but none the same you should appreciate that there are many different kinds of gears maybe in a later uh, more advanced course on gear design you can uh, uh, study helical gears to uh, more uh, uh, to a further depth another type of gear which is very important again this is what is happening even in your differential of a vehicle is that of a bevel gear if you note carefully these two gears are attached to uh, some sort of a shaft or uh, something which get probably attached to the shaft so the shafts are or extended portions of the shafts would probably be these right so as you can see that these shafts are intersecting they are not parallel as in the case of spur gear so this gearing arrangement is called a bevel gear arrangement right again bevel gear is something we will which we will not study in this talk but if you can understand spur gears then possibly you can take a more advanced course wherein you can get to know how helical gears and bevel gears are dealt with so these are the different types of gears there is there are also a few more that is uh, uh, you will have a warm gear arrangement and etc but we are not going to talk about those arrangements maybe your design of machine elements course would talk about that this is mostly about the kinematics of gears okay i think this is the right time to take a pause in case you have a, a question or anything to ask i'll uh, respond to you okay ggipg is asking that is the torque transmission of spur gear more than the helical gear see the question of how much torque is permissible in a spur gear as opposed to helical gear is a different question the only <coughs> the problem in spur gear in terms of transmission as you will come to know when we talk about contact ratio is that sometimes the, the the contact between the uh, pair of tooth is abrupt sometimes there will be one pair of teeth in contact sometimes there will be two pair of teeth in contact so depending upon the load sharing capability suddenly there will be an abrupt change that the tooth will see in terms of the load that it experiences so accordingly this leads to wear and tear of the gear tooth in helical gear due to the geometry of the tooth the contact is gradual gradually the tooth come into contact and gradually the tooth goes off to the contact right so in that sense the wear and tear associated with the helical gear tooth is much lesser than in a spur gear so if you presume that these two gears are made of the same kind of material having the same kind of lubrication facilities then one would expect that because of a smoother uh, engagement process that typically happens in a gear then uh, the life of such gears are more but the question of what the torque transmission of spar gear being more than a helical gear you can transmit the same amount of torque but the question is if you do transmit the same amount of torque then possibly the spar gear will have lesser longevity than the helical gear because you know the contact is very erratic so as to say in spar gear whereas the contact is smooth in helical gears and as such the life of spar gear will be enhanced in comparison to uh, sorry the life of helical gear is more than in uh, spur gear because the contact is smoother okay uh, carrying on what are torque and speed variations in case of planetary gears well we have not yet come to uh, planetary gears but essentially the same idea goes through in planetary gears also even in planetary gears it's uh, finally a torque i mean it's there is an input uh, 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 something is an input something is an output whatever gear train arrangement that you give it is finally going to scale up or down the speed and accordingly the torque so uh, what we are going to do in the last part of the course not today but maybe two days down the line we are going to analyze the speed ratios of different planetary gears if you assume that the speed ratios get scaled with the power uh, with the power being held constant if you get the speed ratios you can also get the torque ratios and that will give Uh, your uh, desired answer tpc is asking what are the application of bevel gears as i said one typical application of bevel gear is in the differential of your automotive and the reason why it is used in a differential of an automotive is that when you have a vehicle 
and it has to take a turn then one wheel has to move at a different speed as compared to the other wheel. So from the same input you have to generate two outputs which are related in some way but the two wheels cannot move at the same speed when the vehicle is taking a turn as opposed to when the vehicle is moving on a straight line. So that can be attained using bevel gear. So if you are interested please read about differentials uh, if you uh, or see some nice animations of how differential gear system works. So uh, in that you will see bevel gear application. IGCEP is asking is there a limited value of torque ratio up to which spur gears can be used. Yes, if you want a very high torque ratio you should go for a warm gear arrangement. Uh, typically there will be limitations but these limitations are dictated most from the material perspective you know. If you have uh, a good material or maybe a case hardened material where uh, the gear tooths have been sufficiently surface treated and the wear and tear of the gear has been arrested then you can carry on the spur gear even to a larger extent of torque. But you are right in saying that the torque ratio typically for our usual spur gears which are available will have a strict upper limit and the limit of it arises from the failure perspective of the material. It does not arise from any kinematic perspective or any dynamic perspective it arises from the perspective of the material erosion that takes place because finally in a gear mechanism what is happening perpetually is that there is a rubbing between the two surfaces which are in contact and if the surface treatment is not good enough uh, in, in, in the gear material then eventually this material will come off this will get eroded it will get worn out and that is what will limit the torque ratio or if, if you actually put a very heavy torque it, the tooth itself can break because it is not able to sustain that load. So therefore um, that, that is a requirement technically speaking and you can get over that requirement in going for a better sur surface treatment or a better material. But yes with the same material if you wish to have a higher uh, torque uh, transmission then you should not go for a spur gear you should go for uh, a warm gear will uh, accommodate a much higher torque transmission. Okay, going to the next question, what are the applications of spur gear? Can we use bevel gear instead of spur gear? Bevel gear and spur gears are completely different applications. Bevel gears can be used only in case you are interested in transmitting motion between two intersecting shaft. Spur gears are used only in the case where you are interested in transmitting angular motion between two parallel shafts. So the alignment of your shaft hopefully is fixed in which case the type of gear that you should use in order to attain this transmission of motion characteristics will also be fixed. And to your first question that what are the applications of spur gear? Spur gears are used let us say in the lead box if you see it is a spur gear arrangement. Uh, uh, as I said high end cars would mostly go for helical gears but uh, uh, you will have uh, in, in probably lower end cars and lower end vehicles you will have even spur gears. So spur gears are used in auto in certain kinds of automobile applications. Spur gears are usually the cheaper variants, helical gears are, uh, are the more costly variants. Okay, another question what are specific applications of helical gears over spur gears? Again as I said helical gears are used in automotive, I mean it is almost the same application. It is just that helical gears are uh, having better, uh, <coughs> what do I say, be better transmission quality, better uh, load bearing capacity as opposed to spur gears but they are difficult to manufacture they are more costly to manufacture so they are more costly variants of spur gears. So it is as simple as this. So if the application such as you are really looking for a high end car then everything should be helical gears as opposed to spur gears. But if you are not ready to put in the additional investment associated with the manufacture of helical gears then you may as well go for spur gears. Okay. So that is the distinction in terms of uh, helical gears and spur gears. Okay, JNTUA is asking why do helical gears produce less noise than spur gears? Uh, well that depends upon the type of contact. If you look carefully the contact between the spur gear tooths are abrupt whereas the contact between helical gear tooths are continuous. It is not abruptly changing. As I said when we come to contact ratio we will realize that at times one pair of if for a case of spur gears which is what we will talk. The contact ratio uh, concept will elaborate to us that at times there is one pair of gear tooth which is in contact for a spur gear and at times there are two pairs of gear tooth which are in contact. 
this essentially means the, the, that the load that is seen by or uh, by the tooth is changing or the distribution of the load as uh, is changing and as a result this is causing some dynamic fluctuation because this change is very abrupt suddenly from one one tooth pair it will become two tooth pair so this will lead to a very abrupt change in the load transmission characteristics between these two gear tooth such abrupt changes are not allowed in a helical gear tooth if at all things change the changes will be gradual and as you know if you hit a surface abruptly it will cause vibration and it will cause noise whereas if i hit the sub surface continuously i can i can apply the same amount of force but if i apply it continuously it is not going to vibrate or produce noise whereas if i apply the same amount of load but if i apply it abruptly it will vibrate and produce noise so as a result with this analogy you can uh, possibly visualize that helical gear tooths will be quieter in operation and that is one of the usps of helical gear tooth okay someone is asking about normal force and tangential force in a friction disc so what i'll do is i'll quickly explain that part so as i talked about in friction disc there are two friction discs in contact each of these friction discs are going to be mounted on some shaft which is shown here there will be a normal force obviously there between the two friction discs because the two friction discs have to be in contact if you just let it hang loose then there is no normal force then there is uh, virtually no contact either so these are the normal forces and this is omega 1 which means the velocity of this point of contact is omega 1 r1 because this is r1 right so to have a velocity of omega 2 uh, uh, r2 equals to omega 1 r1 so that means the omega 2 r2 should also be this way so that means omega 2 has to be this way right so uh, in other words if the one of the friction disk is rotating in a counter clockwise fashion the other will rotate in a clockwise fashion right and uh, this is the kinematics of it but uh, let's talk about the uh, free body diagram of of this two friction disc already as is, what is shown is that there are two forces which are the normal forces what i will now indicate are the frictional forces the frictional forces are definitely there because that is what is causing the no slip condition so if you look carefully that the uh, driver the i am i am taking this disc the the lower disc as a driving disc so this driving member is trying to move in this direction which means there is a resistive torque mu n mu in mu n is the friction force that is acting which is trying to resist that motion but because of the action reaction pair there is a mu n that is going to get transmitted to the other member that is mu n here right so if i draw the free body diagram of each of these discs there is a normal force and there is a frictional force there is a normal force and there is a frictional force so this frictional force is basically going to give me the torque so torque is mu n times r1 or r2 as the case may be right so the torque is basically mu n times r1 r2 this is what i said and the point is that this normal force is going to eventually get transmitted to the shaft also because the disc which is experiencing that force n is going to transmit that force back to the shaft this is the free body diagram of the disc not of the shaft but now if the disc has to be in equilibrium it has to get a force n from the shaft which means it, the shaft has to get back the same force n which essentially means that the shaft will be subjected the shaft which is holding this disc will be subjected to a axial for, sorry a transverse force in so as you know that beams are very flexible uh, uh, structural elements and this transverse force acting on a beam type of a structure which is shaft in this case will cause a shaft deflection and once the shaft deflects the gear which is sitting on the shaft will also sort of move from its position and either it will interfere or it will lose contact the gear or the friction disc as the case may be so shaft deflections associated with the shaft which is 
on which uh, a transmission member is mounted is basically going to be uh, having a very adverse effect on the transmission quality. And this is exactly what I have uh, tried to elucidate in my talk. I hope that makes it clear for you. This which gear is best for high pickup and which one for speed. Uh, see, I, I possibly do not get the question, but uh, uh, what you are asking is which one is the best gear. There is nothing like this is the best gear and this is the worst gear. Depending upon applications, you should choose the gear and also you should have an eye on the economics of the situation. There is no point in having a very hi-fi gearbox and thus increasing the cost of your vehicle, whereas you know that your vehicle is going to be sold in a certain segment and it is not permissible to have such high costs. So, it do not go with what you think is the best. Rather, Please use your good uh, wisdom in understanding whether within the, the, the economics of, uh, of the application should dictate whether you should really choose the best. Sometimes, uh, you know, depending upon the economics of the situation, you are supposed to choose a suboptimal technical solution. If so be it, that as I said, for a spark gear and a helical gear, the choice is basically dictated on economics, right. Uh, that is one factor. The other factor is, you know, when you are talking about shafts of different orientation, if you have, let us say, skewed shafts, that is shafts which are neither parallel nor intersecting, you cannot go for a spiral, uh, you can, you have to go for a different gear which is called a spiral gear, right. So, there are different kinds of gears in application. You cannot say this is the best gear and this is the worst gear. Uh, depending upon what type of transmission you want, what is the cost associated with the transmission, you should choose what is the gear which is supposed to be used in that application. I hope I have made myself clear uh, theoretical portion. So, now we will start our study on pitch uh, on spur gears. So, the first objective will be to dissect out the gear and to acquaint ourselves with the different terminologies associated with the nomenclature of spur gears. So, from here on we are only going to deal with spur gears. So, the most important geometrical Correct, uh, geometrical term that will arise in our study of spar gears is that of a pitch circle. So, let us see what pitch circle implies. By the way, the figure here shows just a small portion of the gear. This, these are the tooth of the gear. The blank of the gear is not shown in its entirety. We are just showing a portion of it such that you are able to appreciate the different parts of a gear. As I said, pitch circle being the most important, we will take that head on. So, pitch circle of a gear is an imaginary circle. Please understand there is nothing that you will be able to see uh, on a gear which, which readily shows that this is the pitch circle. It is an imaginary circle on the gear which rolls without slipping on the pitch circle of a mating gear, transmitting identical motion as that of the mating gears. So, the point is that uh, uh, this is where the dis all the discussion started that you know uh, things are already conceptually there in the friction disk idea. It is just that the friction disk is not a workable idea owing to the fact that the shaft will bend and eventually break also and therefore, uh, we had to contrive a different application which is, uh, which is what our tooth wheel application or a gear application suggested. But the point is that we somehow want to relate the motion transmission between gears to that of a, the case of the friction disk. So, the point is even if we have engagement between a gear tooth pair. So, let us take that there is two pair of there, there is a gear here. And there is another gear here. I am just showing an instant where only one tooth is in contact, one tooth pair rather is in contact. We would like to replace this situation with that of a friction disk. So, we would like to think that whatever is the motion transmission that is happening in this case can be made equivalent to a motion transfer between two friction disks of this sort. So, we will try to contemplate that this motion transfer can 
that is achieved through this gearing arrangement can be equivalently attained by two friction discs which are shown in this fashion. So, the radius associated with each of these friction discs is what is said to be the pitch circle radius. So, associated with each gear basically embedded in the idea of gear is the idea of friction disc. Whatever motion that the gear pair is transmitting, we would like to visualize that as an equivalent motion between the two friction discs and the associated geometry of the friction disc will then become our pitch circle, right. So, therefore, pitch circle is an imaginary artifact which is sort of going to be very useful in terms of replacing the kinematics of a gear with that of a friction disc. Because friction disc, the analysis is pretty simple. We would like to hold on to the simplicity of the analysis in friction disc, yet we would like to relieve or mitigate the engineering problems associated with friction disc. So, therefore, we are getting into gears, but the analysis we will always try to fall back on this idea of friction disc while we do the analysis. And therefore, we will get the analysis and the results out of it pretty simple in a simple fashion. And to this end, to this idea that you wish to replace the gear with the friction disc, the concept of pitch circle arises. So, pitch circle is precisely that friction disc because as was elaborated to you, friction disc essentially rolls without slipping on top of the other friction disc such that the motion trans transmission does take place. So, pitch circle is that precisely that friction disc, it is an imaginary circle which rolls without a slipping as a friction uh, disc should do on the pitch circle of the other mating gear such that the transmission is identical in both the cases, ok. So, that is the uh, definition of pitch circle and I hope you got the concept clear because pitch circle will be referenced very frequently. Pitch circle, the, the entire geometry of the gear is based on the pitch circle, ok. So, let us now once again look back to how the motion transmission of the gears do happen. With this analogy where we are saying that the motion transmission between gears is identical to motion transmission between two friction discs with diameters equal to pitch circle diameter. So, we have contrived this pitch circle business simply to replace the concept of motion transmission of gears to a concept of friction disc. And we pretty well know how to do the motion transmission for friction disc because that was omega 1 r 1 equals to omega 2 r 2. So, here too we will get the same relation, but remember r 1 r 2 are the pitch circle radius, r 1 r 2 are not any arbitrary radius which you may measure looking at the gear, right. So, that is the point that comes. But before we do that, please note that the point of contact of these two circles is having a technical name that is called the pitch point. So, the equivalent pitch circle or the friction disc if you would like to call them, they will meet at only one point because friction disc by the very nature of its operation should be meeting at one point. It cannot be a surface contact, it can be only a point contact in the front view. In the uh, three dimensional it is obviously a line contact, but in either case it is a higher pair of mechanisms. So, therefore, there has to be only a point contact in the front view as is depicted in this illustration. So, this point contact between the two friction discs or equivalently the pitch circle is called the pitch point. So, the two discs roll without slipping at the point of contact, they will have the same velocity as we have uh, explained in the case of friction disc and that essentially leads to this very important result that omega 1 r 1 is equals to omega 2 r 2 even for a gear, right. But please note this radius when we are talking in the perspective of gears, this radius is something actually which you cannot take a scale and measure it. It is not even visible. That is why we say it is an imaginary circle, but it is there in the uh, design of the um, uh, uh, of the gears that everything is referenced with respect to this geometrical parameter which is called pitch circle radius. So, we have got back the same kinematic uh, result that we had even for our simpler case of friction disc omega 1 r 1 is equals to omega 2 r 2. But please note that 
a gear transmission system is a positive drive system as opposed to a friction disc system. What I mean by positive drive system is that one member is pushing the other member to move, whereas in a friction disc case the principle of operation was based on the fact that it is a no slip condition. The friction is sort of tying the two members together and is ensuring that there is no relative motion possible between the two members. So, the uh, physics of the motion transmission is completely different between the friction disc and the gear. However, the mathematics turns out to be equivalent that is in both cases we have omega 1 r 1 is equals to omega 2 r 2. Okay. So, that is about motion transmission of between gears which is with reference to the pitch circle not any other circle. Now, we will get to see many more other different kinds of circle in the gears and actually some of them are easily discernible when you see the gear. For example, if you, you could very well contemplate that there is a circle passing through the outer periphery of the gears and this circle which obviously is not drawn. So, therefore, uh, you we still say that it is an imaginary circle, but it can be uh, visualized with a very little effort that a circle which just passes through the outer periphery of the gear will be called as addendum circle, right. And addendum itself is the radial distance between the pitch circle and the addendum circle. So, the addendum circle is here, pitch circle is here and the radial distance between the two is the addendum, okay. So, that is the uh, nomenclature for you. The dead endum circle is the circle which is passing through the innermost uh, region of the tooth or, or the base of the tooth if you may say, but the technical word base is base circle rather is reserved for something else. So, it is a uh, I mean it is a circle which is passing through the bottom of the tooth just like the addendum is passing through the outer periphery or the top of the tooth. The dead endum circle as is illustrated in this drawing is an imaginary circle which is passing through the bottom of all of these tooth and therefore, similarly you can define dead endum to be the radial distance between the dead endum circle radius and the uh, sorry the radial distance between the dead endum circle and the pitch circle. So, this is the dead endum circle, uh, this is the dead endum circle which is marked here and this is the pitch circle. So, therefore, this distance is the dead end ok. Carrying on face width, face width is uh, the, the portion of the gear which you see in the side view. This is the front view of it, this is the side view of it. So, in the side view this area that uh, the, this width that you see is the face width. So, the thickness of the gear along the axis is called the face width. Remember the tooths are cut out such that the tooth is parallel to the axis of the gear itself right because this is a spur gear. Had it been a helical gear, this would not have been true. So, for the face width is the dimension along this depth direction of the uh, tooth. So, this is what is called face width. The portion of this surface which is above the pitch circle is called face and the portion of the surface which is below the uh, pitch circle is called the flank. Remember the contact between the two gears will take place along this surface. So, all sorts of surface treatment should be done on this surface because this is what will be prone to, uh, to the rubbing action once the contact takes place. So, this is very important in terms of uh, you know uh, manufacturing uh, reliable gears, uh, gears which have long life. You should do the surface treatment on the face and flank of the gear. Uh, on this portion which is called the top land of the gear, you do not need any surface treatment because there is no rubbing action that is going to happen in the top land or even in the bottom land. It is only going to be the face and flank which will be prone to a lot of surface uh, related failures and uh, as a manufacturer of gears, you will do well to enhance the surface uh, characteristics of these gears, uh, as, as surface characteristics of this region. So, technically the surface over which the contact between the two engaging tooth take place is the face and the flank. The face is the portion which is above the pitch circle, flank is the portion which is below the pitch circle as depicted in this drawing. Top land and bottom land, top land is the area at the top edge of the tooth, the, this is the top edge of the tooth, the one which is passing through the, uh, through the addendum. Now, if you go along the depth direction of the uh, gear the area that is recovered is going to be the top land. 
Similarly, the bottom land is the flat land that you see at the base of the tooth that which is corresponding to the dedenda. So, that is called the bottom land. So, area at the bottom edge of the tooth along the direction of thickness will be called the bottom land. But please remember top land and bottom land there is absolutely no contact between the uh, engaging gear tooth that is taking place. The contact between the engaging gear tooth will take place in this surface or the other surface depending upon what becomes driver and the driven. So, usually these face, faces and flanks of the gears will go through a I mean there is a requirement that there has to be a good surface quality of these uh, portions. Uh, if uh, surface quality need not be achieved in the top land and bottom land owing to this uh, application requirement. Okay, coming to the next terminology circular thickness. So, circular thickness is the thickness of the gear tooth measured along the pitch circle. You may see that at the addendum region the tooth thickness is smaller whereas at the dedendum thickness the tooth thickness is wider. So, when we wish to refer to what is the thickness of the tooth we cannot quote a single value because the thickness of the tooth is changing as one goes from dedendum to addendum it is de decreasing as it goes from dedendum to addendum. So, therefore, as I said most of the geometry will be with reference to the pitch circle. So, when we quote the value of thickness of a gear it is technically termed as circular thickness because it is the thickness measured along the pitch circle because pitch circle is the most important geometrical reference point in our study of spur gears. So, here we see that the pitch circle if we travel along the pitch circle if we take a string and along the string if we if, if we measure using this string al along the pitch circle if we measure the thickness then this thickness will be referred to as the circular thickness of the gear. So, thickness of the gear tooth measured along the pitch circle is the circular thickness. So, <coughs> that would be uh, given by this uh, it is not referred to in this circle uh, in this illustration as I see it uh, may be tooth thickness what is referred to is basically the circular thickness that is right. So, this label tooth thickness which is the thickness along the pitch circle is the equivalently the circular thickness. I have taken this picture from Norton's book. So, Norton refers this to as tooth thickness it is equivalently called circular thickness. Okay. Next is space width. So, just like we measured the thickness of the solid portion of the of the teeth we would like to have a measure of the extent of the gap between the two teeth right. So, that is technically called as space width that is the the uh, if we try to measure the distance between these two points on the pitch circle obviously the width is different at the addendum and at the dedendum. At dedendum the width between the gap between the two teeth is less the gap between the two teeth is widest at the addendum level. But if we wish to refer to a single geometrical parameters which sort of gives a feel of what is the space width that should be with reference to the pitch circle. So, accordingly space width is defined to be the distance between two consecutive gear tooths measured along the pitch circle. So, as I said it is always that the geometry is referenced with refer uh, with respect to the pitch circle. You will note that it is within this space width that the teeth from the other meshing gear will come and sit such that the engagement takes place. So, to ensure that there is no interference or rather there is adequate space for the uh, corresponding gear tooth for another gear to come and sit in this space and hence uh, have the engagement with this gear usually space width will be larger than the circular thickness which means the amount of gap that is left is larger than the amount of solid material that is there at the pitch circle level because you do not expect that the uh, teeth will get completely inside, but it will it should get in at least to the level of the pitch circle. So, once you have a teeth which is going at uh, going inside this gap you will have a good engagement. You cannot have a situation where the thickness is greater than the width in which case the tooth will not be able to get in it will actually have interference readily, but interference in the terminology of gears means slightly different thing we will come to it in a moment. But you can understand that to permit 
a smooth engagement you need to have space width to be at least same as circular thickness but in fact more gap is left and this gap the difference between space width and circular thickness is actually referred to as backlash. This backlash can be a, a great uh, uh, nuisance in certain applications. Let us say in certain applications if you wish to reverse the motion of the gear. So uh, let us say uh, this gear drive is, is actually used to, uh, to rotate a rudder as the rudder is tracking a military aircraft vehicle. right? So, if the rudder has to continuously track the motion of a certain aircraft which is doing very strange maneuvers and the gear essentially controls the motion of the rudder. So, in certain in such situations it may be necessary to have a reversible gear that is the driver gear may rotate in one direction and also the other direction depending upon how the rudder wishes to change its course which again depends upon the motion of the military aircraft. So, if the driver gear wishes to reverse the direct uh, reverse its direction then you can understand when it reverses the driver gear will have to traverse a distance which is equal to a backlash without actually driving the driven gear. So, within this small time this uh, when, when the driver gear is traversing through this backlash there will be actually a no load condition for the driver gear and the driver will actually not drive the load which is the rudder weight in this case I mean the motion of the rudder being the load. So, in such a case you are going to have a backlash. So, the controller will say that the driver gear has been rotated, but even the drive when the when the driver gear even if the driver gear has been rotated by the controller it will not affect any actual motion because it is moving through a through the backlash region. wherein the driven gear is not rotating and therefore, there is no motion transmission to the radar. So, this backlash can be of uh, very detrimental consequences, but in, uh, in a more uh, uh, sort of civil application like as you have in automobile uh, cases backlash need not have that uh, bad effect. We can live with a little bit of backlash especially in terms of longevity because uh, we would like to keep a little bit of backlash to make sure that the uh, uh, gear tooth has a very perfect engagement without any adverse uh, effect in terms of wear and tear. So, in terms of longevity this backlash is a good thing that is why I said depending upon application certain thing may be good or bad. So, backlash is good in terms of longevity, backlash is not good in case of military applications where tracking with an accuracy becomes the sole criteria. Okay. So, carrying on with other uh, ter terms and terminologies. The next term we encounter is that of a circular pitch. So, circular pitch is the distance along the pitch circle between two identical points. So, consider this point right at the center of this tooth and uh, for a successive tooth if you could take a another identical point then the distance between these two measured not along the straight line, but along the pitch circle again is going to be the circular pitch. So, circular pitch is the distance along the pitch circle of two identical points on successive tooth. Right? So, these are the two successive or consecutive tooths you pick up two identical points measure its distance that becomes the circular pitch. So, as you know the total circumference uh, uh, measured on the pitch circle is pi times dp, dp being the diameter of the pitch and if there are n number of tooth on the uh, gear that means there are n number of segments on this circumference on the pitch circle. So, therefore, the pitch circle uh, or, or sorry the circular pitch would be the pitch circle circumference divided by the number of tooth. So, P c which is the circular pitch or the circumference of the pitch circle divided by the number of teeth is going to be pi d p by n. So, this ratio d p by n is going to be very important pi times d p by n is referred to as circular pitch and n by dp the inverse of dp by n is called as diametral pitch and dp by n is called module. So, in other words circular pitch is module times pi right and diametral pitch is reciprocal of module. So, these three quantities are very related module circular pitch and diametral pitch different uh, standardizations exist in terms of 
which the different gear dimensions are standardized. So, gear dimensions will be usually standardized with respect to the module or the diametral piece depending upon which conventions you look at. There are BIS conventions, ACMA conventions and so, and so on and so forth. I will show some of those conventions to you in uh, possibly the next class. But uh, the crucial point at this stage to take home is that these three concepts module, diametral pitch and circular pitch are all interrelated and it will turn out that all these other parameters uh, like addendum, dedendum, tooth thickness, all of these will be referenced with respect to these quantities. Okay. So, when, when they sell gears, they usually have it referred that this is the module of the gear and this is the pressure angle with it comes in standard sets of module and standard sets of pressure angle. Once you know the module and the pressure angle and you are knowing which standards you are using, then you can recover all these dimensions in uh, using the formulas that are available in, in, in such standards and I will quote one, one of them as we go along. So, uh, that makes it very imperative to understand the concept of these, uh, these interrelated concepts basically diametral pitch module and circular pitch. So, as I said as per the sta standardization geometric dimensions of the gear is given in terms of module or diametral pitch and it, it is important that the machine gear, machine gears two gears which have to engage with each other, they must have these, uh, uh, these um, parameters to be identical between the two gear tooth. And there is a reason why you know the uh, engaging gear tooth has to have the same module or the same circular pitch. The reason is just geometrical, nothing else, just driven by kinematic consideration, which is what I am going to show to you. So, um, please remember that module uh, is d by n and diametral pitch is the reciprocal of it and the circular pitch is pi times module. All of these ratios between the two engaging teeth, uh, be between the two engaging gears must be same and the reason why it is, it has to be same is driven by a kinematic consideration as is shown in this slide. So, the, <coughs> what I have shown here is two time instants when a pair of gear tooth is in contact. So, at time t equals to 0, we have this picture where the red pair of tooth is in contact and at a later time instant, the uh, engagement has changed. So, the red pair of tooth has now lost its contact and the contact has now come in the blue pair of tooth, right. So, the red pair have, of tooth has gone this way and uh, and it is it's, it's the blue pair of tooth now which has been in contact. So, the successive tooth has now taken its place. So, this is what is happening after a later time instant delta, right. So, after a delta time, the blue tooth pair has now come in contact. So, uh, this tooth has come here, this tooth has come here, this blue tooth has now taken the position of this red tooth, this blue tooth has now taken the position of this red tooth. So, basically what has happened between these two time instant is that this blue tooth has taken the position of this red tooth which is what you see in this diagram and this blue tooth has taken the position of this red tooth, right. And what follows is a green tooth which will eventually take the position of this blue tooth in the next time instant which is not shown, right, because this is enough for our analysis. So, what we realize is that after a certain lapse of time, it is a succeeding tooth which will take the position of the tooths which are presently in contact, right. So, in other words what that means is the following that is the time taken by the blue by this blue tooth to occupy the position of this red tooth must be exactly the same as the time taken by this blue tooth to occupy the position of this red tooth. So, this is what we will try to find what is the time taken to analyze uh, to for each of these tooth to occupy the position of its uh, tooth which is lying ahead of, of this tooth, right. So, accordingly we will firstly compute what is the distance traversed by these two blue tooths such that it is able to take, play, take the place of the red tooth at t equals to 0. And that distance divided by speed will give the time and if we know that the time has to be exactly matching, then we will get our conditions that we are looking for. 
so that the angle of between two successive tooth in any gear will be given by 2 pi divided by the number of teeth because the total angle over the entire gear is 2 pi and if you know the number of teeth to be n then the angle between any two gears will be uh, sorry the angle between any two tooth successive tooth in a gear will be 2 pi by n accordingly for gear 1 the angle between the blue tooth and the red tooth which are at successive positions will be 2 pi by n1 n1 being the number of gear uh, of tooth in gear 1 similarly the angle between the successive tooth in gear 2 will be 2 pi by n2 n2 being the number of tooth in gear 2 right so theta 1 is 2 pi by n1 and theta 2 is 2 pi by n2 so the time interval by which this gear uh, 2 is uh, or, or this tooth in gear 2, blue tooth in gear 2, gear 2 is occupying the position of the red tooth in gear 2 has to be exactly the same as the time interval at which this blue tooth in gear 1 occupies the position of this red tooth in gear 1. Based on this consideration, what is the time taken for this blue tooth to cross a distance of theta 1? that is theta 1 divided by omega 1 and theta 1 has been evaluated to be 2 pi by n 1. So, therefore, the time required for this blue tooth to come and sit in the position of this red tooth is going to be 2 pi by n 1 omega 1. Similarly, the time taken by this blue tooth to come and sit in the position of this red tooth that is at the level of gear 2 will be theta 2 divided by omega 2 theta 2 has already been found as 2 pi by n 2. So, therefore, we will have 2 pi by n 2 omega 2 as a time taken for this blue tooth to come and sit in the place of this root red tooth. But as we know, as we have argued rather that the time taken for each of these tooth sitting on two different gears must be exactly the same. Only then the picture will completely repeat after every engagement. So, therefore, we must have these two quantities to be exactly the same and this essentially means that the number of tooth is inversely proportional to the rotating speed. What we have also figured out from the kinematic considerations from the no slip conditions from the analogy of friction disk is that the uh, rotational speed bears an inverse proportionality even with the size of the gears. So, we have also seen R1 omega 1 equals to R2 omega 2. Now, what we are seeing presently is n 1 omega 1 is equal to n 2 omega 2. So, both the tooth thickness, uh, so both the number of tooth as well as the size of the gear are in inverse proportionality with the speed of the gear. So, as such the speed of the gear and the number of tooth are directly proportional which means r 1 by n 1 must be equals to r 2 by n 2 and as you know that effectively means the diameter by the number of tooth are got to be same that that ratio of diameter by the number of tooth have got to be the same between any two engaging gears. If this condition is not met the engagement will not happen because engagement if at all it happens it has to be identical between the tooth pair which is coming in contact. You cannot have a completely different sort of engagement that is happening between the different tooth pairs. So, therefore, to have identical engagement this condition is a must that the ratio of diameter to the number of teeth must be exactly be the same for both the gears that is uh, under engagement. And that effectively means that the module, the circular pitch, the, <coughs> the, the diametral pitch uh, uh, all of these things are have to be the same diametral pitch, module, circular pitch between two engaging gears must be the same. This is the requirement that we were talking about few minutes ar earlier. Okay, going ahead now, the next concept, I will just like to revisit elementary uh, concepts of mechanism just to give you an idea about uh, or rather just to revive the idea of what is a higher pair mechanism. So, higher pair mechanism because we understand our gears are higher pair mechanism. Let us just look back as to what a higher pair mechanism means. So, here what I have shown in the schematic illustration is that 
there is a blue body and there is a red body and there is just a point contact in the front view of it. If you consider this bodies to be three dimensional essentially there is a line contact. What has not been shown is the side view of it. The, if you consider the side view you can take it to be a line contact. In the front view there is a point contact. So okay in general for a three dimensional bodies of this sort you will get to see a line contact. Such contacts when uh, mechanisms finally are interconnected bodies. When these interconnected bodies have line contact we call them higher pair mechanism. When these interconnected bodies have surface contact we call them lower pair mechanism as you get to see a pin joint. When you have a pin joint then basically it is the entire area outer area of the pin which is sort of forming the uh, area of contact between the two interconnecting members. So, pin joints are therefore lower pair mechanisms uh, or pin jointed uh, links form a lower pair mechanism whereas higher pair mechanisms will have only line contact or point contact. Now what is so special about higher pair mechanisms? As you can understand from this illustration if I hold the blue body fixed there is two possible motions that I can give to the red body that is I can undergo a curvilinear translation on this blue body. Contemplate the blue body to be fixed in which case you can have either a curvilinear translation of the red body. So, it can just translate on this surface of the red body or like a wheel does it can have a no slip condition maintained at the point of contact and it can rotate about this point of contact. So, these two motions are completely distinct <coughs> and therefore, we get to uh, infer that the higher pair mechanism is essentially a two degree of freedom system. The two degrees of freedom being relative translation as well as relative rotation. Please note that the lower pair mechanisms that possibly you have studied the uh, revolute joint and the prismatic pair are all one degree of freedom. Uh, they, they allow only one degree of freedom. So, for example, in a prismatic joint only translation is allowed. In a revolute joint only a rotational motion is allowed. Whereas, in this sort of a higher pair mechanism both are allowed and that is one of the characteristics of these higher pair mechanisms. The instantaneous center if you recall what is instantaneous center? Instantaneous center is a point on this uh, uh, on, uh, you could mark a point such that this the instantaneous center whether it is embedded in body 1 or body 2 will have the same kinematics, will have the same velocity I am sorry not the same kinematics, it will have the same velocity. So, we are talking about instantaneous center of velocities. So, our the deal that we have wish to uh, uh, ascertain now is what is the instantaneous center of a higher pair mechanism. So, instantaneous center by its very definition means it is a point embedded in both the bodies such that whether you consider this point to be embedded in body 1 or you consider this point to be embedded in body 2 either way it has the same velocity. So, you have to find that instantaneous center now between these two higher uh, bodies which form a higher pair mechanism. But then you realize that when the bodies are forming a higher pair mechanism there can be two possible relative motion either of curvilinear translation or that of rot relative rotation about the point of contact. If it is relative rotation about the point of contact then as I said then <coughs> practically the point of contact is, is under a no slip condition. It is just like a wheel which is gripping the surface. So, both uh, the, the point of contact whether you assume it to be the point on the blue body or in the red body either way it has zero velocity. So, the point of contact essentially becomes your instantaneous center. So, in dealing with the relative rotation or rolling without slipping condition the point of contact is the instantaneous center. It is uh, different in the case of relative translation. In relative translation since this body is undergoing curvilinear translation on a curvilinear path, the center of curvature of the curvilinear path is essentially the instantaneous center because you can replace this as a higher uh, uh, as a lower pair mechanism and once you replace this as a lower pair mechanism it is easy to understand that the revolute joint of this lower pair mechanism is going to be essentially the, uh, the instantaneous center. 
So using all that analogy, you would have uh, uh, looked at your elementary uh, kinematics uh, discourse that there are two types of in instantaneous center that are possible in a higher pair mechanism. Now these two cases are actually the extreme cases. You can have a mixture of both. You could have relative translation also embedded along with the relative rotation or rolling without slipping. So in which case the instantaneous center could also be the position will be changing. But these two are being the extreme cases, it is easy to figure out the instantaneous centers in these two cases to be one in the case of relative sliding, it falls to be on the center of curvature of the path. In case of rolling without slipping, it falls exactly at the point of contact. Please note that in both the cases, the instantaneous center is actually passing through the common normal between these two bodies. So, obviously the point of contact passes through the common normal. Also, the instantaneous center which is the center of curvature in this case, the center of curvature also passes through the common normal in this case. This is true for any body, not just bodies which are shown on in this fashion in the circular, uh, uh, what looks like circles is actually true for any body, not just circularly shaped objects. That is because any arbitrarily shaped object can be approximated in an infinitesimal sense as a circular shaped object. So using all these concepts, we arrive at a very crucial result which says that the instantaneous center between the higher pair lies along the common normal between the interconnecting bodies which form the higher pair. So here we have these two bodies which are forming the higher pair. So we can be dead assured that whatever be the relative motion, whether it is rolling without slipping as in this case or it is the case of relative translation or it is a case of a mixture of these two motions. In any condition, it will all, it is assured that the instantaneous center will be along the common normal. But the point is where exactly on the common normal it will, it will fall, that is not assured. If it is at the, uh, if the kinematics is such that it is only relative sliding, it will be at the center of curvature, that can be pinpointed. If the kinematics is such that rolling without slipping is the type of motion that we are getting, in which case the point of contact is the instantaneous center, so again it can be pinpointed. But in general, the motion can be a combination of these two motion, which is why the instantaneous centers cannot be determined in a pinpoint fashion. We cannot exactly locate on the exact location of the instantaneous center between two general higher pair of, uh, two, two general bodies forming a higher pair mechanism. So that being said, we, we will understand that instantaneous center none the same will lie along the common normal. The exact location on the common normal where it is located, that will be determined only if we know something more about the motion itself. But we will see and in, in the next slide possibly that there are uh, ways in which we could determine one of them being Arnold Kennedy theorem. But at this stage, we only appealing to the basic kinematic arguments, we can only say that the instantaneous center of the higher pair mechanism can, can lie anywhere along the common normal. Where it lies cannot be determined through this argument at least. And all this is pertinent because gear tooth in mesh will form a higher pairs. So we will see how to determine instantaneous centers for a gear tooth pair and that will eventually lead to what is known as fundamental law of gearing. This is the basic premise based on which the geometry of gear will, gear tooth rather will get determined. So we'll take that part up possibly in the next class because it's a conceptual uh, topic. Uh, but we'll start from here that we, with this basic background of, uh, of the gear geometry and the terminologies associated with it and with a basic understanding of the instantaneous center concept of mechanisms, especially that in higher pair, our next milestone will be to determine the instantaneous center for a gear pair which is in engagement because finally this gear pair will form a 
higher pair mechanism and from there on it will lead us to what is known as the fundamental law of gearing. So that will be taken up in the next lecture. At present I would like to stop here and if there are any questions or clarifications based on today's lecture material I would be happy to resolve them for you. GJB is asking is the gears more powerful than a hydraulic arm? See there is there's nothing like less power or more power. The power is coming from an engine. The power is never comes from the transmission. So if, if your question is, is the gear able to transmit as much power as a hydraulic mechanism? That question is well taken. But there is nothing like gear power. The gear does not have any power because the engine delivers the power. The gear simply transmits the power. But in the transmission process, it does play with the torque speed ratios. That is the objective of the gear. Gear is not a powerful or less powerful uh, machine element, right. But if you are looking for very high transmissions at low speed, then hydraulics is the solution. If you are looking for high speed transmission, then hydraulics will not do it for you. Hydraulics will have some lag. Uh, uh, then you should go for a mechanical transmission and gears are essentially mechanical transmission. SUCCT is asking me what level of backlash is acceptable. That is again dictated by application. If it is in my car, I do not mind a little bit of backlash. It may give me some vibration uh, at the most, but I may not feel it also, right. But if it is a military application, it is dictated by how much is the tolerance levels of your application. So I cannot quote a number saying that this much backlash is applicable. Okay, uh, BEC is asking what is pressure angle that will be covered in tomorrow's lecture. I would not like to be dwelling on that right now. What is the role of module of a gear in power transmission? Module of a gear is an important concept in terms of standardization. All the gear geometries are getting reference. I can poss uh, possibly show you the result. Okay, uh, I think uh, in one of my later slides, I would have uh, these gear geometries being standardized. Yeah, so this is, uh, uh, these are the standard dimensions of a typical gear. So as you see, uh, the M here stands for module, it is not meter, right. So the addendum, dedendum, working depth, hole depth, circular tool thickness and many other parameters of the gears, all of these will be referenced with respect to module. So essentially what the gear manufacturer will say is that he is selling gears of a certain module, let us say 2.5 module. Once he says that to you and he will also say the pressure angle, pressure angle and the module are possibly the only things which you need to know. Everything else can be calculated based on such standard formulas. This is uh, based on the SI standards, there are ACMA standards, there are BIA standards. Each of these standards have different variants of these formulas. But if you know which standard uh, the gear has been manufactured as per which standard, if you know the pressure angle, if you know the module, then you can work out all the geometric details of the gear that you are seeing on the shelf and therefore it is very important uh, in referencing the gear. So that is the application of module for one thing. Uh, GGIPG is saying why gears are circular above the pitch circle only at the face. I am sorry I did not understand your question. Gear, we are talking about circular gears. There are non-circular gears also possible but we are not talking about non-circular gears at least in this course. Uh, circular gears is what is interesting to us because circular gears will give us a uh, constant angular velocity ratio. Uh, I do not get to see the point that what, what you meant by saying that this is circular is only above pitch circle. See if you, if I can show you the geometry once more, gears uh, something like this. Yeah, so gears, uh, spur gear or helical gear, each of them, if you take a section of it, it is a circular. So gears are circular, the, at least the ones that we are talking about, the gears are circular. I really did not understand what is your confusion regarding circularity of gears. Maybe you can talk about it. If you hand raise, we can clarify it. Okay, there is a question from RITSDS, what is instantaneous center actually? Uh, looks like you have not uh, come across this concept, which is usually taught in the first part of the mechanisms course. So uh, look back at my lectures, uh, 
the video of it will be posted. Uh, but just to be brief, instantaneous center is a concept between two interconnected bodies. Finally, you must understand any mechanism is a group of interconnected bodies. If you take any two interconnected bodies, the question is, is there any point that you can identify which has identical velocity, whether you consider that point to be embedded in body 1 or body 2. If you can find that point, that point is the instantaneous center. Right? There are ways of finding instantaneous center. Usually we do it uh, for lower pair mechanisms, but I am doing the proportion that I am dealing with is about finding instantaneous centers for higher pair mechanisms. You will do well to look at any book in mechanisms if you are not comfortable with it. Uh, just read up the first part, it will have uh, the concept of instantaneous center explained. If you want further help, uh, talk to me. Uh, hopefully, after the class, we can have a discussion about instantaneous center. Okay, SVC is asking is lower pair observed in mechanism of gears? Uh, actually, the interconnection between the shaft and the gear is a lower pair. The interconnection between the two gears is a higher pair. So, in that way, if you call that uh, there is a revolute joint basically, which is the interconnection between the shaft and the gear. So, in, in such a fashion, you can argue that there is a lower pair sitting in the transmission box. But what I was referring to is the engagement between the two gears itself. I was not referring to the engage, uh, the contact between the shaft and the gear. So, in this respect, I was qualifying the engagement between two gears to be that of a higher pair mechanism. Okay, is height of tooth of one small gear the same as height of tooth of bigger gear despite the difference of radius of gears? Yeah, uh, <coughs> you are talking the GGIPG is talking about the tooth height possibly. So, all of these are referenced in, uh, in the standard tables and as you will see that these standard tables are all referenced with respect to module, right. So, all the geometries will be with respect to the module. So, between any two meshing tooth, you will have the module to be fixed, right. So, if the module is known, as I said, every other geometrical dimension can be recovered and these formulas will give you those geometrical dimension. So, this is something that you will learn when you come to gear design probably. This is not a course in gear design, this is about kinematics of gear. How does the motion transfer uh, between the two gears take place is the most important objective that we have in our present study, but I do not mind taking a few questions on gear design also in case you have a natural interest towards that topic. Okay. Uh, going to the next question is how will the effect the power transmission of the circular thickness of the tooth of the gear is increased? Explain in context to face with. See all these dimensions are referenced basically from the strength criteria of the gear because finally, what will happen is that the gear will, tooth will have to take the load and when it takes the load which is greater than what it can endure, it will undergo failure. So, what the gear designers will do is with experiment, uh, extensive experimentation, they will figure out that what is the maximum load that can be endured by a certain dimension of the gear. Accordingly, they will figure out what are the dimensions that is required in order to transmit a power. But in this discussion, which is about kinematics of gears, we are basically concerned about, I mean, we are basically assuming that the gear is a rigid body. We are not worried about the flexibility of the gear tooth. Remember, stresses and strains arise because of the flexible or compliance of the structural system. It does not arise if the structural system is assumed to be rigid. It, failure does not arise if uh, the question of failure hence forth is therefore is not uh, apparent in the study of rigid body dynamics. Here, when we are talking about kinematics of gears, we are taking basically the perspective that we are taking is that the gear is a kinematically rigid object and we are looking at how to design the, let us say the tooth of the gear such that we attain a constant angular velocity ratio. That is our primary motive. But I take your question that, you know, what are the factors that go behind in the calculation of the exact geometrical details of these gears, uh, gear, of these gear tooths. The factors which go behind in the calculation of these numbers is the, the numbers that you see on your slide. 
are basically the strength calculation. So there are FEM calculations possible, there are uh, experiments possible based on which they arrive at what is the acceptable values of face width, of tooth thickness and so on and so forth such that the tooth will not fail during its operation. Uh, the next question is what is the significance of friction between geared tooth? See the as I said uh, the as opposed to a friction disc which works on the principle of friction, the uh, principle of operation of a gear does not depend upon friction. It is a positive drive system. Positive drive system means one element or one member is pushing the other member because it is one tooth which is pushing the other tooth and that causes motion and torque transfer, right. So friction typically is not required. So therefore you should have well lubricated uh, uh, gears whereas it is the other way around in case of friction disc. You should uh, the friction disc will work only if there is friction. If you make friction disc which are having a super lateral finish and which are very very well lubricated essentially you are bringing down the friction and then it will not be able to transfer torques at least to a high level right. So therefore uh, the I mean th that was the reason why we shifted to gears as opposed to the academic concept of friction disc. So the significance of friction uh, uh, is absolutely not there in the operation of gears. But practically speaking there is friction you cannot reduce friction to zero and when these uh, gears are in engagement because of friction there is loss of energy, there is a transmission efficiency concept but transmissions have known to be much more efficient than the, uh, especially the mechanical transmission is much more efficient than the engine itself whereas the engine efficiency is of the order of 40 percent, 50 percent I am talking about the thermal efficiency but transmission efficiency can go up to 95 percent. So therefore usually uh, friction can be controlled by a well lubricated engine but it cannot be killed completely and whatever friction remains is going to be a drain to the power requirement uh, I mean to the power calculation it is going to be a power loss. So you will do well to have a well lubricated uh, transmission system which uh, sort of does away with the frictions that is there between the mating gear tools. VC is talking about redundant degree of freedom. The redundant degree of freedom concept does not arise in case of gears. It arises in mechanisms. So this uh, six hour talk is not about mechanism. This talk is about gears. So I will refrain from giving you uh, talking about uh, redundant degrees of freedom. Redundant degrees of freedom does not arise at least in spar gear context. So uh, no point in talking about that. Okay, how does the number of teeth on gear affect the transmission of motion? Uh, the number of teeth uh, in a gear affects contact ratio, it affects the interference aspects. So the number of teeth if the question for that you had in mind is that if we could do it with let us say a very less number of teeth, why manufacture a gear with so many teeth? But then if you uh, have a gear with very few number of teeth as will be shown there will be a chance for interference. So therefore you must have adequate number of teeth we, what we will do hopefully in the next class is that we will find out a criteria which determines the minimum number of tooth to avoid interference. So therefore if any, any number of tooth which is beyond that critical limit is going to be good enough for our uh, working purpose. The other issues that are there in the selection of number of tooth, these are all gear design questions basically, these are not kinematics of gear question but in on the same I am taking it. So the other factor which goes behind the selection of number of tooth is let us say contact ratio. So contact ratio essentially determines how many pair of gear tooth is in contact. If there are more number of tooth pair that is in contact then there uh, the, essentially the load is getting shared by so many number of tooths rather than just a one pair of tooth. So that actually uh, uh, implies that there is less stress that is developed on the gear tooth and therefore the gear tooth can have possibly a longer life. But there are there is more to it than meets the eye so high contact ratio gears have their own problem. So all that I wish to say is that the manner in which these, these uh, uh, details are fixed is a matter of gear design. And most of these things have been settled 
by long periods of study and therefore standardizations of the kind that you see on your slide at this moment has been arrived at. But this course is not about gear design, this course is about uh, understanding the motion transfer characteristics of a gear assuming them to be completely rigid. Just like in engineering mechanics and mechanisms course you assume that the bodies of your interest are completely rigid and they do not have any stress considerations at least in the course. Therefore, and the analysis proceeds with that basic assumption. We will have a similar perspective for the study of gears also, but yes, the question is well taken that uh, stresses do arise in practical application and we based on the amount of stresses which are getting induced during the actual operational condition, the dimensions are determined. But such stress calculations for a gear tooth is too far fetched to be done in this course. You will need a more advanced course on gear design to be able to understand how stress calculations in operating gear tooth are done. But let me settle this issue by saying that dimensions of all uh, the individual uh, geometrical parameters of the gear are arrived at not only from kinematic considerations, but also from stress consideration. In this course, we are in this talk rather, even in your course, in your mechanism course, is not going, you are not going to deal with uh, stress calculations of a gear, right. So, uh, the stress calculations of a gear can be a more involved subject. You can do it as a part of your project probably uh, using some FEM type calculations. You can look up the research literature also. There is enough work done on it. Uh, all that I will say is that if you wish to appreciate that, you need to do more advanced studies on this topic. Let me thank you for your uh, interest and patience. So, we will call it a day here. We will meet again in the next session. Thank you.